when we start uh, prophylaxis on a patient, I always tell the patient about the side effects and the nature of drug they are taking. I tell them they have to take it for at least three to six months, at least. And I tell them that they must wait at least two to three, even four weeks before the drug begins to work. This means that, number one, we don't try, say, propranolol for one week, and then, hey, it doesn't work. Switch to amitriptyline for another week, and hey, it doesn't work, and switch to another drug. What we need to do is to stay on one agent at the minimum effective dose for at least, at least uh, four weeks. Uh. Sometimes patients suffer, and then we can't bear to see them suffer, so we, we want to do something for them. But actually, you need up to perhaps six weeks before the effect of the medicine becomes stable. So I encourage us at least one month, uh, uh, don't switch the medicines. Give each drug a good trial before moving on to the next. I also preempt questions now from the patients who are given amitriptyline by telling them this is an actually a, a very old-fashioned antidepressant and at doses of 100 to 200 milligrams, it will work for depression. But I'm going to start you on 10 milligrams. Ah, then they will, you can see their faces relax. Because once you talk about antidepressants, all kinds of warning bells go off. And they will come back to you and say, why do you give me antidepressant? Or they'll go back to the internet and search. So we don't want that to happen. Not because we want to be free of, of being, any accusation of hiding things from them, but simply because if they are not sure about the medicines they are taking, they will not be compliant, and then they will continue to have problems. Then tell them that the medicine doesn't always work 100%. I will tell them there's a 75 to 80% chance that uh, they will benefit from the medicine. I don't speak of cures. I tell them if you stay okay for a while, then uh, we should carry on the medicine. Your brain sensitivity will reset and then uh, it may take weeks or months after stopping before the headache comes back. It's to improve quality of life, not to cure the headache. Then I individualize the treatment. Uh. If patients are truly depressed, yes, I will start on an antidepressant and I will tell the patient so. Uh, if the patient cannot sleep, amitriptyline is good, you know, and so on. If the patient has epilepsy, then you can start an anti-epileptic. The idea is to individualize the treatment. Women especially are very weight conscious. Okay, some men too, but women especially. So if you give them amitriptyline and Sibelium, they will not thank you like, at the end of the day. You know? The headaches are gone, but they are fat. You know? um, start at a very low dose and go slowly and continue for one month. And if it's all right, then for three to six months. What medicines can you use? Migraine is a long list of drugs, which is a happy scenario in one sense because it gives us choices and unhappy in another because it means there's no one perfect drug for us to use. Beta blockers, our old friends are there. Atenolol, propanolol, metoprolol. There's a new one on the block. Concor has been shown to work for migraines. I will say that I don't use propranolol or metoprolol uh, because metoprolol is more expensive and propranolol you have to give more than once a day. I always use atenolol. I feel that if you give prophylaxis more than once a day, patient compliance will drop. So I always try to stick to a once-a-day drug. Sibelium and verapamil are there as well for calcium channel blockers. Verapamil, at this dose, will invariably cause some degree of hypotension and always uh, constipation. So I don't use verapamil. Flunarazine, I will say, is excellent for migraines with vestibular dysfunction. When a patient comes in with migraine attack and they have spinning giddiness, flunarazine is the best single drug uh, in my experience but it does cause weight gain. Bisotifen also causes weight gain. Uh, I've, I don't really use this one, but it does work. Antidepressants. Amitriptyline is still, to my mind, the gold standard, but it causes significant drowsiness and there are anticholinergic side effects. Prozac will work, although it's not as good as amitriptyline. Effexor is expensive, has good antidepressant effects, and has recently been shown to be helpful in migraine prophylaxis. I do use quite a bit of this drug in my practice. Anticonvulsants. Well, in the past, we used to have only epilim, which made people fat. Now we have topiramate, which can make people thin. <laughs> topiramate is beloved by women. They end up becoming thin and not very bright. <laughs> because topiramate, the main problem is that you, you get cognitive side effects. Yeah? Uh, 
Uh, not everybody can take it. But once you say that it helps them to lose weight, oh, you see their eyes light up. So uh, it's the best studied migraine preventive drug of the modern era. Okay? Topiramate truly works well for, uh, for bad migraines. Gabapentin at the dose recommended to my mind is nearly intolerable. <laughs> very, very sleepy. So I don't use it. Also very costly. Naproxen has been suggested and proven as a migraine preventive. I don't use it except as prophylaxis for menstrual migraines. When the patients have got regular cycles, I start the day before the headaches are due to start and I carry on for a few days. So it's short-term prophylaxis. That's when I would use naproxen. Right? Because if you use naproxen every day, a proportion of patients will end up with medication overuse headache. Now, if you have a migraine patient who has high blood pressure or a high blood pressure patient with migraine, apart from beta blockers, you can also start them on angiotensin receptor blockers. Atacan and uh, lisinopril have been shown to work. Others, uh, this is the most interesting one. I think this is very interesting. By the way, this is a migraine knife, huh? the picture there. The migraine knife is not to hack out the head or brain. The migraine knife actually has a hollow handle containing camphor, which has been used in the past as a migraine remedy. But anyway, that's for fun. Herbal preparations like butterbur and feverfew have been shown in double-blind placebo-controlled trials to be effective in migraine. The problem with herbal preparations, I think, is that it's very hard to standardize the efficacy. And one brand may work, one brand may not. Magnesium works. It's very safe, especially in pregnant women. I like riboflavin, vitamin B2. The only side effect is yellow urine. Right? Full doses is uh, four capsules a day, two twice a day. For patients who uh, are concerned about taking serious medicine, this group of medicines is wonderful. Coenzyme Q, very expensive. Botox, yeah, it will work in a proportion of patients, but also expensive and requires some familiarity with its use. This group uh, is interesting because it gives us evidence-based alternatives to conventional pharmacotherapy. If the patient is the kind that you know, we all have, don't want to take uh, medication, but will take vitamins and supplements, then these are the evidence-based ones that we should recommend to them. In pregnancy, we always say prefer non-pharmacological treatment, use Panadol first. Codeine is okay, except in the third trimester because of the risk of delivery and respiratory depression. NSAIDs, okay, except in third trimester because of the risk of a patent ductus arteriosus. I am stamatil in bad vomiting is okay. And for prevention, Prozac, as a member of the SSRI class, they are quite safe drugs. We have the most experience with Prozac, metoprolol, magnesium, are generally safe. But of course, uh, where possible, we try not to use drugs in pregnancy. Uh, menstrual migraine, I'll say again, if the cycles are regular, we can give, uh, we can give uh, naproxen, we can give naratriptan for those days where the headaches are scheduled to come. It is not common to have women with pure menstrual migraines. Most women will have migraines throughout the month, but with peaks on day one or so. Okay, but even for these peaks, if they, you know that they're going to have a, have a migraine at least once a month, it is reasonable to use these things. Uh, one note of warning is that if somebody has got focal auras like speech arrest, uh, numbness of the hand, then I wouldn't use an estrogen-containing OCP. In summary, therefore, if somebody is vomiting, use I am stamatil, I am Voltron, you have to give a parenteral drug. If uh, other drugs don't work, don't hesitate to use a trip 10, okay? And oral disposable formulations have an advantage because it gets in early before the window closes. Think about giving prophylaxis, okay? And for each prophylactic drug, patients will ask you, doctor, this drug got side effects or not? And I'll always tell them, all drugs have side effects, right? We just have to use them well. If patients can't sleep, use amitriptyline. Patients have palpitations, use beta blockers and so on. And finally, supplements rather than drugs are now shown to be useful in migraine prophylaxis. That concludes my talk. Thank you.